Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hilal Lashwal. Welcome to this inaugural virtual lecture of all the uh, of, of the All for One and One for All lecture series on mental health in academia. This series is part of an initiative to normalize the conversation about mental health in academia and to explore how we can all contribute to reducing the stigma and fear of the stigma of mental health and mental illnesses. Normal, stigma, mental illness, and mental health are words that seem so simple and clear, but are often misunderstood and have a tremendous impact on our well being and influence how we see ourselves and the world around us daily. Each of these words has a fascinating and complicated history that has shaped their meanings and how they define and shape our conversations about mental illnesses and mental health today. Therefore, we felt that understanding the words and the vocabulary that shapes these conversations is an important way to start this lecture series and our conversations on these topics. We could not think of a more qualified experts to help us understand the history and the impact of these words than our guest, Professor Roy Richard Grinker, who has studied the meaning of these words across different cultures. He's also the author of the book, Nobody's Normal, how culture created the stigma of mental illnesses. A brilliant, insightful, and eye-opening book that draws on extensive research on Sub-Saharan Africa, the US, and South Korea, and a reflection and reflections from his own personal life and history as the son, grandson, and great-grandson of psychiatrists. The book offers hopeful and empowering messages. It also provides a new framework that could help us that could help us transform how we view mental health and how we interact with individuals struggling with mental health challenges. I highly recommend that you read the book and have no doubt that it, like our conversation with him today, will change how you perceive and talk about mental health and mental illnesses. Good afternoon, Dr. Drinker, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I really am honored to be invited. Thank you. Thank you. Join me to joining me to moderate today's conversation with Dr. Günther is my colleague, Galena Lomarenko, a passionate advocate of mental health and a PhD student in my group. A few words to introduce our guest. Dr. Günther is a cultural anthropologist specializing in psychological anthropology. He received his PhD in social anthropology at Harvard University in 1989 and has been a professor of anthropology, international relation, human sciences at George Washington University since 1992. He's an authority in many topics, including the relations between North and South Korea, autism and mental health, and has written many books on these topics and also conducted epidemiological research in autism in Korea. His book on autism, The Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World, of autism published in 2007 was written in part as an attempt to make sense of an intensely personal issue, his daughter's autism. He's also, as you will see today, a brilliant speaker and a compassionate communicator. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Tell us about the book, Nobody's Welcome. What motivated you to write the book and how did you come up with the title? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I came up with the title of the book, Nobody's Normal, from a student um, who uh, was listening to me talk about the prevalence figures in epidemiologic studies, such and such percent with autism, such and such a percent with depression, eating disorders, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder. And a student said in the classroom, uh, isn't anybody normal anymore? And I replied, no, nobody's ever been normal. Normal is a category that we constructed to really try to push people to conform to a particular ideal. So I really was from, from my students. And my students play a role in this book because even at the, in the background, they are the ones who really taught me about just how much has changed in terms of disclosure, ownership, advocating for oneself, representing oneself rather than being represented by others. And I wanted to write a book that captured what those factors were that were changing our discussions about mental health for the better. 
So what other factors, you know, personal experiences influence the framework and maybe the content of the, of the book? And did they change over yeah. the time you were writing the oh, book? That's a great, great question. Yeah, they did. So my, my great-grandfather was a psychiatrist. My grandfather was a psychiatrist who was analyzed by Freud in the early 1930s in Austria. My father was a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, and my wife was a psychiatrist. And despite working in very different historical contexts over, you know, between the late 1800s and today, they all taught me the same thing, which is that mental illnesses are double illnesses. First, the condition itself, and second, the sometimes harsh moral judgment that society's place on that illness. And that's why it's kind of a double illness. And I came across this quotation in the New York Times from the mid 1940s, where my grandfather, after World War II, where he was a very important psychiatrist running North African psychiatric operations for the army, uh, said, we've eradicated stigma. And I thought, well, that was premature. Why did he think that? And I started to look into wars and the military, and I was going to write a book about military psychiatry. And so I wrote the middle of the book first. And then I thought, you know what? I can just flesh this out into a larger study of the longer history and international scope of the ebb and flow of stigma. So the first part of the book, the three parts to it, deals with uh, the origins of European capitalism and the growth of an ideal of autonomy, independence, uh, personal responsibility, that capitalist ideal that serves as the benchmark against which we judge people who are dependent on others. Uh, the second part of the book deals with wars and how global crises though I couldn't deal with COVID yet because it was too soon, but how global crises like war tend to be an equalizer where we begin to expect and find reasonable that people will have emotional suffering because it's a traumatic time. And then the third part of the book deals with what I see as the wrongheaded efforts of uh, research communities to begin to frame mental illnesses as brain disorders rather than as a complex interaction between the brain and society and the body. So let's start with the world, uh, with the word normal. This is a word that affects the lives of millions of people, if not everyone on the planet today. It's also there is billion dollar industries that have now been built around on the words normal and abnormal. When you look at the, de de the dictionary definition of the word normal, you come up with these confirming to a type, standard or regular pattern characterized by that which is considered usual, typical or routine. Your book shows that the word normal has a more complicated story, history in our lives than medicine, and it presents compelling arguments against this definition. Could you please tell us about the history of the world, the word and its use and misuse? Well, the word normal, in English uh, meant average. And it was used in the United States for the designation of normal schools. Normal schools were schools that were supposed to teach the sort of average stuff that every child or uh, adult should know. Um, it was not a concept that people wanted to aspire to until after World War II, when normal changes from being a mathematical term to one that becomes a kind of ideological tool to push people to conform to something. Um, a lot of people credit Alfred Kinsey, the famous sexologist, with having popularized the word normal. And he did so by arguing against the concept of normal. But, you know, contrary to his, his efforts, he actually ended up making the word something that could be used colloquially. And so since that time, the word normal has become something that we associate with what we want, some kind of ideal. And if you can't achieve that ideal, and as I say in the book, nobody's normal, we feel inadequate, we feel weak, we camouflage our problems, we hide uh, our problems. And 
Um, my argument in the book is that we can't change the humiliation or the shame or the fears around mental illnesses by education or awareness. We have plenty of education in the world, plenty of awareness. We can only change it by altering our ideals of what we consider to be a good and valuable human being. Yeah, and this gets me to a very important point that you, you make in the books uh, and in many of your talks and the idea that people are unique individuals who cannot and should not be categorized by, by conventions and that everyone should have the freedom to be oneself. Could you elaborate more on that? Well, I guess I'll answer the question by, by continuing this topic of, of, of normal and my grandfather, who in uh, the very early 60s, uh, he and my father did a study at a small uh, all-male college outside of Chicago. And whereas most researchers who were studying mental health among young, among adults, would look for all the people who were quote unquote normal, set them aside and only look at the ones with the mental illnesses, they decided let's do the opposite. Let's separate all the ones who qualify for a mental illness and just look at the ones who are quote unquote normal. And he found that these men were uh, in a word boring, the <laughs> average, they, they had little ambition, they weren't creative, uh, they had a sort of narrow interests. Um, they uh, were just, um, you know, the, 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 the most ordinary of people. And my father and grandfather asked the question in this article, is this the cost of normality? Is the cost of normality a lack of creativity, innovation, diversity, and so on? And I, that was a really visionary thing for somebody to say in 1963 when they published this piece in the archives of general psychiatry, because this is decades before the neurodiversity movement. And they had to repeat that question just to make sure that the reader didn't know they were joking um, because their argument was that normality was actually the essence of suffering. Mm -hmm. this, this benchmark nobody could achieve. And if they did achieve it, well, they were, not going to be very successful and then not fulfill the ideals of a capitalist society. So basically, you know, it's people who fail to conform to yeah, the and, and cultural the expectations are the people we would call abnormal. Yeah, yeah. And, and David Reisman, the sociologist uh, from Harvard, you know, coined this term, the, the age of conformity, to describe the 1950s. You know, everybody wants to be like everyone else. And in that context, if everybody's supposed to be like everybody else, what happens if you have a child with a disability? Well, we know Eric Erickson, the father of child psychology, has a baby. He and his wife have a baby at, who's born with Down syndrome. And they whisk the child off to an institution, never even telling anybody that that child was still alive. They came home, they told their friends, their family, even their own children, that the baby had died at birth. And so this young man, uh, Neil, um, had never, when he died, he'd never met his siblings. He had not seen his father for however long he'd lived. Um, there are no pictures of Neil. It's in that context where everybody's supposed to be normal that we ended up really marginalizing people. And, and that is an example, just one example, Eric Erickson's child, but you could multiply that example. I mean, we've had enormous, um, uh, I guess you would consider them human rights violations in the United States, at least associated with uh, institutionalization. We still institutionalize, but more of the mental health care uh, residential institutions now are jails with, where mental health care is shifted into the prison system. So today, who's, who's deciding what constitutes behavioral and social norms? And why do most of us just go along and accept you know, such definitions? And I think we're not anymore though. We're not getting, we're, we're not accepting that, you know? The student stands up in front of my classroom and says, I have Tourette's disorder. The student who says the eight, having ADHD uh, diagnosed was the best day of her freshman year. People who are, are, are openly transitioning from, you know, 
uh, male to female or transgender uh, youth and adults. I mean, these are not people who are going along, right? That's true. Um, this is neurodiversity is about not going along. And, and this is a movement that, again, um, I argue in the book is not because there's just one, you know, there's not the, the growth in uh, uh, acceptance and disclosure is not just because Lady Gaga and Prince William say they've suffered with mental illnesses. It's not because we have more education. It's because things have changed throughout all sectors of societies throughout the world, um, you know, in lesser and greater degrees to begin to, not to undercut the title of my book, to, to normalize difference as opposed to um, see difference as something that should be um, eradicated. Fascinating. So let's go to the second term, which is sort of mental, uh, the term of mental illness. So how did this term become culturally embedded? You know, where it, it, yeah. you know, it's only been a few um, hundred years um, that we've had this idea that there are distinctly mental illnesses. Um, you know, in the first asylums, particularly in, in France and, and in England uh, in the 1700s, uh, for the first time, because they had asylums, and for the first time you had enough people together for scientists to start to classify different types of people. And, um, and that is where a specifically mental illness becomes designated. And from that moment on, when we separated illnesses of the body from illnesses of the mind, this Cartesian legacy has damaged the um, ability for people to get the care they deserve and need. And it has created barriers to social <clears throat> acceptance and the integration of people into communities in which they can lead meaningful lives. If you look at some of the literature now on uh, what is sometimes called in the media mass hysteria or unexplained illnesses or, uh, or, or even conditions that have names but for which there's still some disagreement like chronic Lyme syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, a Gulf War illness, you will see the stigma as the subtext. There's something called Havana syndrome where diplomats are experiencing <laughs> all sorts of neurological uh, impairments and they are sick. They are, they are experiencing you know, real um, uh, losses of function, but they refuse to see it as something that has a psychological component because they say, no, it's real. Um, how do we get to this place where we say that a physical manifestation of an underlying emotional or psychological problem isn't real? I mean, for me as an anthropologist, that's particularly interesting in sort of analyzing these narratives about mental health because mental illness is real. <laughs> it's not made up. And most people in the world actually do experience emotional distress through their bodies. Whether it's, you know, having a, a, a phantom pain or having a paralysis or fatigue or, or just feeling your blood, your capillaries dilating in your cheeks when you're blushing. So you, in the book, you, um, you mentioned before that the scientific classifications of these uh, mental illnesses can actually sometimes impede our effort to define ourselves by ourselves. I was wondering if you could tell us about some of the examples of how people with mental illnesses have, have been able to bear their own narrative of disability or mental health challenges. I think that, uh, that the neurodiversity movement is a good example of that, where um, people um, with autism have been able to advocate for themselves and to talk about their abilities as well as their challenges. Um, and that, I think, has a lot to do with the economic changes in the world, that we've become a high-tech global economy in which features of the person with autism that used to be disabling have now become enabling. Mm 
repetitive uh, behaviors and narrow interests and incredible um, skills at systematizing. That doesn't mean that everybody with autism is going to be Bill Gates or Elon Musk. Yeah. But it does mean that people who would have been socially marginalized to the, to, the, to the degree that they would not have the educational and economic opportunities that those people have had, that has changed. That has changed. It's a, the, the, I, I mean, the way I put it is that the high-tech economy is the sort of modern revenge of the nerds. <laughs> people who were, were, were on the outs are now revalued. And it's, it's also because of the kind of advocacy that people have. And I tell the story of my daughter, Isabel, who when she graduated from high school, my daughter, Isabel, is autistic. And when she graduated from high school, she gave a speech and you could hear murmurs in, in, the, in the audience as people were wondering, who is this unusual person with this unusual way of speaking? Um, and, um, and then when she said the words, people with autism like me, the room just quieted down. You no longer heard those sounds of stigma because they now had a framework that she had given them, that she had taken ownership of so that she would not seem enigmatic, mysterious, bizarre, weird. She defined herself and that gave her incredible strength. And so that kind of empowerment of the neurodiversity movement is something I applaud and I think is an answer, one answer to your question. I completely agree. In, in discussing the frameworks, the way we typically view you know, mental health and people with mental illnesses is in the framework that tends to project all the blames on the individual and ignore the role of culture and society. Again, you address this topic quite extensively in the book and you always say that we need to stop assuming that when one is suffering, it is their fault. Could you please elaborate sort of on that position and then how can we reframe this concept of collective responsibility into our discussion of mental health challenges? It's such a great question I'm, that I could go, I could say a ton about it, but let me just say that, you know, when society takes some responsibility, that is when we lessen stigma, either because society takes responsibility for causation, like trauma, adverse childhood circumstances, for example, or when, um, when um, mental illnesses are dealt with in a way that invokes social support. We know from the World Health Organization's longitudinal studies that the best outcomes in people with schizophrenia, meaning fewer psychotic episodes, less severe psychotic episodes, work, marriage, things of that sort, that the best outcomes are in non-industrialized communities where people have extended family and large social supports. But when we look at a place like London or Washington DC in the World Health Organization studies, where people are trying to live alone or in nuclear families, we see worse outcomes. So when we have more social supports, people do better. When they have fewer social supports, they do worse. Social supports are like the, the, the number one thing that we all can agree on has an effect on good outcomes. But also in terms of causation, it's important. I talk about uh, kids in Brazil in the book who are willing to accept uh, treatment for ADHD um, if ADHD is framed not just in terms of a problem with their learning or their, their, their behavior at school, but their struggles with um, systemic um, racism and inequality, where in Japan, um, depression has become something that is really decreased in terms of its stigma, when depression is attributed not just to the person's mind, but to the struggles of working in a very, very competitive um, educational and economic environment and caring for an aging population. So wherever we see society take some of the blame, whether it's spiritual causation or social supports, that's when we see stigma decrease. We get back now full circle to this idea of the autonomous, independent individual who is just set up in, you know, de Tocqueville's America mm -hmm. for, um, for feeling shame, humiliation, and a sense of, of weakness. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, of yours is, 
people are disabled when society makes them so. That's true. Think about a person who is differently abled, uh, differently mobile in a wheelchair. Is that person disabled when there are ramps and elevators? The person's not disabled. The blind person is not disabled when there are plenty of tactile references. And I give the example of 19th century Martha's Vineyard, this very sort of fancy vacation spot near Boston, Massachusetts, where in the night, by the end of the 19th century, uh, about a quarter of the population had some degree of hereditary deafness. Mm -hmm. And deafness was not considered an illness. It was considered a kind of variation of humanity. And everyone spoke sign language. And because everybody spoke sign language, everybody was able to communicate. And you could argue, not only was there nobody who was truly deaf on Martha's Vineyard, but that there wasn't deafness as a disability. So moving on to the word stigma, you know, whenever one starts the discussion about how to tackle mental health in, in society or with an institution, the first word and the first sort of action item that co usually comes up is tackling mental health stigma. In the book, you write that the word stigma is not self-explanatory. Explanatory. You also arguing that, argue that using the word stigma without understanding its history could lead to the word being a conversation, conversation ender instead of being a conversation, a conversation starter. Could you please elaborate a bit on that and what, and what you mean? Yeah, um, when you look at a lot of the literature on barriers to care, the researchers will go through the typical kind of you know, infrastructural barriers, geography, poverty, um, you know, and low access to care and so on. And then they always say, and then of course there's the biggest obstacle, which is stigma. Well. Stigma becomes a kind of wastebasket, like or a, or you just the where you throw everything you can't explain. It must be stigma. If we don't look at stigma with depth and detail, then I don't see how we achieve any kind of change. Because what does that word mean? It can mean that people pay attention to you and stick and, and marginalize you. It could mean they don't pay attention to you. And, and you're invisible. It could mean that um, you are prevented from certain kinds of economic resources. Um, it could mean that you're prevented from being mobile or from having political rights. We have to see stigma more as a barrier to a meaningful life and figure out what those factors are and not just try to reduce everything to stigma because uh, because then, then we won't make any progress. We just say, so what, why won't they do this? Well, it's stigma. And of course we can't change that. You gave the example of deafness, but are there other examples where sort of mental illnesses were not always accompanied by stigma? Um, certainly, uh, there, are, there are many, um, particularly when uh, the causation is seen to lie outside the individual. So, for example, with the um, hunter-gatherers that um, I've studied both in uh, Central Africa and in Namibia, when somebody has uh, delusions or hallucinations, those uh, delusions and hallucinations are usually attributed to some kind of spiritual causation. Um, and in both of the societies in which I worked, sort of randomly, uh, uh, spirits that have randomly settled in a person. And so that's not that individual's fault. He's unlucky. He's unlucky. It may be someone else's fault, like an ancestor did something or a distant relative did something, but the sickness is in the family. The sickness is in the society and not in this one individual's brain. Furthermore, in both of the societies, that I've worked with in, the, in Central Africa and in Namibia, one is not sick when one doesn't have symptoms. So you look at one guy that I write about named Tomzo, who walks 10, 12 miles every month barefoot to get his antipsychotic medications. He's only considered sick in his village when he is 
experiencing symptoms and they are controlled right now by this medicine. Hopefully that will continue. But if you go to the place where he gets the medicines from a North, um, a North European, I think it's a Norwegian um, NGO, they see him as someone who is a schizophrenic. They've labeled him in, with this enduring label. This is an individual who's a schizophrenic. And because of that, they fear him. Yeah. And so you see just 12 miles away, two very, very different ways of dealing with a uh, mental illness. One that stigmatizes the person and one that doesn't, just 12 miles away. I think these, these labels have a huge impact, right? They could, uh, sometimes they could be helpful and sometimes they could be hurtful. Yeah, um, and I think uh, the Japanese words uh, for schizophrenia um, show that. One of the things I write about in Nobody's Normal is how changing the uh, term schizophrenia in Japan in the early 2000s from a really um, very um, almost violent word to a bland word uh, increased the number of diagnoses and the number of people who went to get care. And also the, the speed with which people went to get care after their first psychosis. Um, I mean, the, that's important. The average time in the United States from first psychosis in schizophrenia to any mental health care is 74 weeks. It's a long, long <laughs> time. So if, if the word stigma did not exist, what other words would be more appropriate to describe sort of the cultural complexity and barriers to, to mental health? Well, we can come up with other terms that are racism and sexism and discrimination. And, um, and you know, we can, we can actually start to look in detail at the ways in which different kinds of people and different kinds of communities are subjected to different forms of symbolic violence rather than just say, oh, well, it's, it's stigma. People are ashamed of mental illnesses. You know, I, I, this, per, this stigma pervades the way we think about, um, we still some physical illnesses, but, but much more so mental illnesses and particularly mental illnesses that involve a loss of self-control mm -hmm. like, uh, or, or, or suggest a loss of self-control like addiction disorders, substance abuse disorders, and psychotic disorders. Um, the, um, going back again to the individual ideal of aut autonomy and accountability, but even our major research institution in the United States, the National Institute of Mental Health, can't bring itself to use the word mental illness. They really, they, they talk about it as an institute of mental health, but the other institutes are named for diseases. The National Cancer Institute, National Institute of, uh, of Substance Abuse, this, uh, neurological disorders. Um, but no, we can't have mental illness because it'll be too, um, you know, it'll be too off-putting for people. Um, look, I don't care what terms we use as long as it helps. And I think sometimes when we use the word mental health, it becomes a kind of euphemism and we, we mask the, both the, the, the degree of suffering, um, but also um, the uh, prevalence of it. Because, you know, a, a big, a, more, well over half of any population through their life is gonna meet the criteria for a mental illness. Mm -hmm. yes. That's a lot more than most of the diseases that are studied in those other institutes. So moving on to from, from mental illness to a bit of mental health. So mental illnesses are usually, is it mental, is a term that describes diagnosed conditions often by professionals such as psychiatrists and psychologists. On the other hand, mental health is a very broad term that covers many things, including our thoughts, feeling, and our ability to understand and interact and connect with the people and the world around us. It's a term that is inclusive also of positive and negative experiences. How do we manage our health and well-being well influences our ability also to achieve our goal? Is there a boundary between mental health and mental illnesses? There is a very clear boundary 
I, I think that in individual cases, there is a clear boundary. And it is when you are suffering to the degree that you can benefit from treatment. Mm. So no diagnosis, whether it's you know, a diagnosis of, of, of an infection or a mental illness diagnosis is of any benefit unless it drives some form of care, some sort of treatment, whether it means special education for a kid or a, or, or a medicine for somebody. Um, and so what that boundary is between health and illness is that point of loss of function. Now, um, I'm a typically an anxious person. Uh, I get anxious about lots of things. And anxiety is something that we evolved as human beings. In fact, if I didn't have some degree of anxiety, I probably wouldn't be here today because I would have been hit by a car because I would not have thought to look both ways when I crossed the street. But that anxiety could go over the border to prevent me from going to my job or to prevent me from having the social life that um, uh, gives my, my life fulfillment or that disturbs my eating or my sleep. At that point, when there are these losses of function, we need care and illness categories drive those forms of care. The problem is when an illness category is one that we see as too frightening to have, right? Yeah. In, in, in your work and, and discussions on autism, you talk about the idea of how thinking about uh, autism as a spectrum rather than a disease, a you know, single entity disease has been transformational in terms of uh, how we view autism. And the same thing for mental health, you know, research suggests that it's uh, multidimensional and lies along what spectrum or perhaps, you know, multiple spectrum. So we do all exist in a spectrum. So tell us about this spectrum and how thinking about men mental health in terms of a spectrum is helpful. Uh, For so many years, um, we have thought about mental illnesses as categorical. In other words, you either have it or you don't. But what I write about in the book is that the recent efforts to look at human behavior on a spectrum is an invitation to all humans on this continuum of suffering, because we all will suffer something at some point in time to greater or lesser degrees. And I think that what the spectrum has done is it has permitted us to see that we are more similar to those who may have that diagnosis than different. Now, when a student comes to me and says uh, that they have PTSD from a bad economics exam, I don't really think that that student believes that they have PTSD. They're using this colloquial term that has arisen from the spectrum so that they can adopt that to describe themselves. They understand that PTSD can be severe and, and lead to suicide. But I think that as we start to use terms like this, whether it's PTSD or somebody who says they're very neat and tidy and so they're a little OCD or somebody who's socially awkward might say they're a little autistic, the more we disarm the power of those words to hurt. And the spectrum has been uh, that kind of a tool for society. It also helps us see that the person who is once labeled may, does not necessarily need to be always labeled because we can move along this spectrum. And it's not just you got, you're, you're, you got obsessive compulsive disorder or you don't, yeah. right? We are, human beings change, even in, in late adulthood, you know, we are moving targets. I think what's also important about having is, is it helps people come into terms with, all, with their own situation and sort of uh, embrace, you know, it helps them make a sense of themselves. And what, you know, and being in a spectrum sort of gives you an empowerment to manage your own mental health in the sense yeah. that you get a feeling, you have a feeling you're not stuck at one point. 
you have the ability to move back, you know, to move along that spectrum. That's a great point because if you think about people with um, new diagnoses of autism in adulthood, I mean, what's the benefit of that for somebody? Uh, there are a few services, you know, you're not going to get special education services in school if you're a 40 year old who's now diagnosed with autism for the first time. But that diagnosis might help the person say, oh, this is why I've always had these troubles. It's not that I'm a bad person. It's not that people don't like me. It's that I have a different kind of mind and a different way of, of being. And it, you know, this is why the concept of autism and Asperger's has been incredibly comforting for a lot of adults who for the first time uh, have kind of found a framework that isn't stigmatizing and which helps them understand themselves. I was, so you, you close the, the last chapter of the book with the following statement. If culture puts stigma and mental illness together, culture can surely begin to take them apart. Yeah. You know, I was wondering if you could say a few things in the sense of what can each one of us do to make this possible and contribute to reducing both the stigma and the fear of stigma? Well, there's so many things that we can do because we have, if, it's, if stigma is cultural, we have the power to change it, right? Yeah. So we can help people with mental illnesses uh, like children to learn how to advocate for themselves. Um, we, if people can't advocate for themselves, we can help them advocate for themselves. Uh, we can understand that we may not be able to change the stigma of mental illnesses for everybody in the world and in, 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 in broad brush strokes, but that sometimes you can have a tide that raises all boats. You can have a uh, autism hiring program at a small company or big company, and it provides a climate of openness and disclosure that will then lead people who are experiencing all kinds of other difficulties, which aren't autism, to feel that they can go to their colleagues or they can go to their, their managers. In um, academia, one of the things we can do is to make sure that professors don't run away from the student who discloses a mental illness and knows what to do. Not that professors should be mental health professionals, but they should know what the contours are of the mental health care in their setting so that they can guide the student to go to the appropriate professional. You know, one of the things that, that, that is a sort of disjuncture in academia is, is between the undergraduates, the 18, 19, 20 year olds who seem very, very open to talk about mental illnesses and the PhD students and professors who are very uncomfortable with it. And now I know that there are reasons for this that are economic mm -hmm. um, and so on. People afraid they'll be discriminated against by their employers. But one of the things students have as an advantage is that they are with a community of students who are cared for to some degree by a whole system of advisors and, and deans and so on. Whereas PhD students and um, master's students and professors for the most part work alone, at least in the social sciences, humanities and arts. And, and it can be very lonely. And you don't really have that sense that you belong to a larger community. So that's a perfect transition to, to, to my, my last topic uh, on the discussion today, which is, you know, why do you think it took so long for, for people to talk about mental health in academia? I mean, it's, uh, you know, you're an academic, you've been in the university and you've been also sort of following this topic for a long time, but we've only started to hear about mental challenges in academia in, in the past a few years. And that's mainly thanks to, you know, the, the recent surveys, which shows how pervasive is the problem mm -hmm. is, you know, showing that 30 to 35 to 40% of the students suffer from some sort of mental health uh, illness or a challenge. But why did it take so long? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's taken so long because those ideals of uh, conformity 
normality and uh, autonomy and independence are just so 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 much ingrained in our history. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago uh, in you know where where I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, uh, that I would have been embarrassed to spend more than a few nights at my parents' house because it would have infantilized me or seen me as somehow dependent. And um, I think that we are uh, beginning to uh, change all of the contours of our social relationships, whether it has to do with um, gay marriage or with um, neurodiversity, um, group living situations. We're beginning to, to understand that independence is an illusion and a damaging one and that to be human is actually to be dependent on others. And so uh, I feel like we're on the right course, but we could easily slip back. You know, one of the things that this book argues is that the history of mental illness stigma is a roller coaster, that the stigma of mental illness ebbs and flows based on social and historical contexts. Right now, we happen to be in a particular context and very specifically the pandemic, where uh, emotional struggles are increasingly normalized, um, expected, reasonable within the context of all of the stresses and strains of the pandemic. But once the pandemic is over, we could recede into back into a time where people would say, well, you have no reason to be suffering now. <laughs> The pandemic's over, in which case it becomes harder and harder to disclose and harder and harder to get treatment. So if you if you were to be called by the president of your university in terms of advising on, on, on a mental health strategy for academic institutions or you know, what are sort of the top two or three things that could be done uh, to help change the culture? And, and, and create a culture and environment where people feel safe and uh, where people feel that they're not, they're part of that continuum, you know? They're, they're different, but they're not abnormal and where they're cared for. One thing I would wanna make sure of is that my institution expand the kinds of accommodations that are available for people. Um, the, the, the colleges and universities or the sections of universities that in my experience often have uh, the least successful mental health care outreach um, are those um, where the students feel that they shouldn't receive accommodations and that to do so is somehow demeaning or stigmatizing. In fact, we used to have a rule, I don't know if we still do, that if a student was allowed to use a laptop in class because they had a disability, that everyone in the class had to be able to use a laptop because otherwise the student with the laptop would be publicly observable, identified, outed mm -hmm. as someone with a disability. Uh, that's not a healthy way of, of going about um, disabilities or mental illnesses in the classroom. Um, we need to provide the kinds of accommodations that make sure the people are um, um, aware that of, of just how prevalent it is. When we tell people who, who really could benefit from an accommodation just how many students receive accommodations, they are so comforted by that. They know they're not um, alone. They know they're not alone, but, you know, they go to a counseling session and they're by themselves in a waiting room or something, and they don't see the, the big the, the big picture. We have to make sure that they know that that they're not alone. And I should say, I see a pretty. I, I see a distinctive population because I teach classes on culture and mental health. So the people who take my classes are probably much more, you know, open my classes select for that. Um, but we are seeing changes across the board. And a lot of that has to do with uh, with numbers and making sure of the case. The other thing I would tell universities to do is to not be afraid that they are going to create mental illnesses by making people aware of the symptoms. I tell the story in the book of Stanford University's efforts to 
um, address eating disorders among uh, uh, college women, Stanford. And they found that the more that women learned about uh, eating disorders, the more eating disorder symptoms they reported. Mm-hmm. And the school was upset. Oh my gosh, we're, we're creating eating disorders. In fact, they were not. What they were doing was they were making people aware of symptoms that they already had, but which they hadn't seen as organized into a concept of eating disorders and they had not reported. And now they were getting care. So when we see these greater numbers, what we see is they're getting greater care. It's not that they're somehow creating more mental illnesses. And this is something that the US military has had to tackle as well. And I quote a famous general in the book by saying, we don't want any psychiatrists in the army making our boys sick. Do you think that uh, some sort of the the lack of quantitative assessment of the impact of mental health in in academia, for example, is is a reason, is one of the reasons behind the lack of urgency? I mean, if you look at the banking sectors and areas where people realize that, you know, there is an economic cost for for people suffering, but in, in academia, there has not been that careful evaluation in terms of if people who are suffering, you have a high percentage of people who are suffering from mental health, be it students or staff or faculty, and frequently you know, the staff and faculty are sort of ignored, then the impact on the mission of the institution, but also the economical impact on the institution, that type of work and research has not been done. And I was wondering whether this could contribute to this lack of urgency to tackle this issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you're right uh, that we don't have enough Uh, epidemiologic studies of the prevalence of mental health problems in um, among academic professionals. Um, We also don't have services. So, you know, if if we were at my university, a university in which we all had to do physical labor, lifting heavy things, we would have checkups all the time on our backs, our muscles, our legs. We'd have all kinds of services to help us with our physical problems. Uh, And here we are in a profession where it's all about our minds. And yet we don't have much in the area of taking care of our mental health. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are afraid that we'll be seen as somehow deficient. Um, We're so, so, Academia, and I can't speak for academia in your setting, but here it's just so competitive. It is. And um, PhD students, you know, they may love their work, but they just don't know, will they ever get a job in academia or not? Um, and it's, um, it's, it's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. And I've had students who have told me that it's taken them two years or three years for them to tell me that they suffer from serious bouts of depression because they thought I wouldn't want to be on their committee or I wouldn't want to um, recommend them for a job. I think one aspect we usually fail to, to, to grasp is that in an academic institution or for in any institution for that matter, the lives of the people within that institution are interconnected. You know, in in academia, the life of a student to the staff, to the faculty, and therefore it's not simple to try to address the problem by tackling only one group. And I think normalizing the conversation within the institution where people are all levels very comfortable in sharing and opening up and sharing their own vulnerability will will go a long way in, 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 you know, if the students realize that they're not alone, right? It's all the faculty experience, the same mm-hmm. type of stress and right. mental health challenges. I think that could help. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing too, is that students uh, are kind of uh, always encouraged to ask for help. Uh, professors aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I mean, I remember when I've had tragedies in my life, um, I have not asked people to take a cl- class for me or teach for me that week. I, we don't ask people to, we don't delegate. We don't ask people to help us. Um, we just try to tough it out. Yeah. And it's also um, rare that superiors take the time to check on those things. 
exactly you know, because and they're you know that's not to put the blame on anybody but because they're also they themselves yeah. are in this cycle of hate. I mean, in my on my my colleagues, many of them have experienced tragedies in the last two years. None of them has asked anybody to to help them. I mean, I would certainly help if somebody asked me. But and it's not that they're not asking me; they're not asking anybody. Yes, yes, I agree. So let me finish with one question, and then in the, you know this social media, it's hard to ignore the role of social media in in uh, the impact in mental health. Uh, so social media and its vast platform, you know, sort of, uh, you know, has it, to what extent it's been helpful and to what extent you think it's, it's not serving the desired purpose? Well, I think it's had a, uh, there are a lot of negative effects that have been mentioned in the media recently, particularly around Instagram and uh, Facebook and TikTok. But uh, there are positive aspects of social media in which people share their struggles and and then others feel comforted by that to feel that they're not alone. I think that's particularly the case when people we most admire like celebrities will um, will disclose the, yeah but you know the, the danger of course is misinformation, disinformation um, where people are advocating, uh, uh, certain kinds of therapies that may not be ones that the majority of doctors think is safe, or where you have um, uh, people who are not sympathetic or empathic to those who have suffered. Um, you know, social media is a free for all and it can become a cesspool. And so I'm really conflicted about it. What I'm not so conflicted about is remote communication remote communication, Zoom calls, teletherapy, um, that's proved to be incredibly helpful for a lot of people. Whether you're on the autism spectrum and you find that you actually have a richer social life mm -hmm. um, uh, through remote uh, communication or whether it's through teletherapy, which many, many people thought could never work. I couldn't see a, a mental health professional on Zoom. It would never work. And yet, Turns out, actually, it seems to be not a bad way to go about it. Uh, so before we start the Q&A session, and please, if you have any questions or thoughts that you would like to share with Richard or uh, other audience, please type in the chat room, in the chat space. So, so what's your next project? What are you working on now? And what's your next project or next book? Uh, well, so um, my next project is uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in the U.S., and um, it is a grant uh, to look at how people are coping emotionally with deaths during the, the pandemic. Not just people who die of COVID, but people who die of anything during the pandemic and how we are able to mourn and to grieve when we can't do it in the way that we we want to. Um, and that varies you know, around the globe. Uh, for example, um, there are certain funerary practices in many Muslim communities that cannot be carried out um, with um, in the pandemic, where you only have a small number of people around and they can't even experience the, the sensory aspects of rituals like fragrances of oils and so on. And how are funeral directors and mourners dealing with that? How do people who need to have um, sit Shiva and have large numbers of people come to their houses, how are they dealing with social distance? And how are we adapting to funerals uh, in a digital and memorials digitally? Are they functioning the way that they're supposed to? Very fascinating topic, and I think this has been one of the most devastating outcome from the pandemic for many families. And uh, you know, well, and I, this occurred to, to me. I mean, my my mother and my sister both died um, during the pandemic, um, not of COVID, but they died during the pandemic, and we were unable, and still have been unable to really do the things that we thought we should do. So Richard, I was wondering if you have now any sort of 
closing remarks or sort of take home messages that you would like the listeners to share with the listeners and the audience we have today and people who will be listening to this? Well, I think that the, um, the main thing that I want to say, which I didn't say before, um, is encapsulated in a chapter called The Dignity to Fail. One of the things that we have done too much in the past is to shelter and protect people with disabilities while we encourage those without disabilities to take risks and even to fail. And every positive story that I've heard about somebody with a disability has been about somebody who was given the opportunity to take challenges that other people thought that they could never meet. Um, I know from my personal experience raising a child with autism who's now an adult that she would never have achieved what she has achieved had we not pushed people to say, well, let's try this and see if she will fail. So when we encounter somebody with a disability, we should not uh, uh, try to protect them. I mean, obviously you don't want somebody with a disability who's gonna be in danger for something, but I'm talking about um, you know, somebody who has autism, for example, and say, ah, oh, well, we don't think you can do this job because we're going to prejudge you around this. The, the, the second thing I would say, which is important in addressing the stigma of disabilities in general, is that we can reconsider how we value certain kinds of, of work and social life. So, if you think back to what I said about the ideals of, of capitalism being so ingrained in us, we can see those ideals expressed as we teach our children that some forms of economic and social life are more valuable than others. When my daughter was being uh, doing a, a sort of an internship to see if she could work at a pharmacy near us, um, she was asked what she does at different times of the day in a, in a pre sort of internship meeting. And my daughter said, well, when I get to work, I'm a cleaning lady. I don't know where she learned the phrase cleaning lady, but she said that. And the manager admonished her, said, you are not a cleaning lady. You are a retail associate. And as an anthropologist, not primarily as a dad, I listened to that and I said, see, here's the moment. This is the moment when a society teaches its children that some forms of life have more value than others. Well, what does that say about the person who wants to be an artist where the chances of great economic success are so yeah. slim or an academic or the person who wants to be a stay at home parent or do volunteer work? Do we negatively value that as well? And so people with disabilities um, have to do work sometimes that is the work that we consider to be of lower value because that's what they are capable of doing. Like some kids with intellectual disabilities I know who love their work, working at a grocery store, but whose families feel ashamed or embarrassed by that. So we need to, on the one hand, help people take risks to achieve, but on the other hand, understand that what people do achieve and what they do consider to be meaningful lives may not fit within our hierarchies of status and, uh, and morality. I couldn't agree more, and these are great words and advices to end with the, the first part. So Galena, maybe you want to share some of the questions on the chat? Yeah, sure. So thanks uh, to both of you for such an insightful discussion. So I think uh, uh, we've got a few questions, and some of them have already been addressed, but um, we can go through one by one. So first one is, I was wondering particularly how the neurodiversity is currently viewed in the context of academia, like the STEM field. Neurodiversity is accepted, of course, but advancing the career, professorship, tenure, etc., is still incredibly standardized, in my opinion. And in many ways, and I feel there is a need to conform to normality to be able to succeed. Do you have any suggestions on how we can change this? I think one of the issues that we have in, um, at least in the area of academia in which I work, is just how much value we place 
on communication, on being able to stand in front of a class, be charismatic, engage the students. Uh, we are performers to some degree. And that immediately puts many people um, who would talk about themselves as neurodiverse at a disadvantage uh, because they may be evaluated differently um, and they may be judged differently. And I think that part of neurodiversity, if it's going to do any good, is also that within um, academia, we allow people to have different, to achieve different forms of success. In my university, we really don't value the great teacher so much as we value the great researcher. But in other places, the great researcher is not valued as much as the great teacher. In some of those contexts, a, any particular individual with neuro, who, who's, who say is on the autism spectrum may excel or may fail. Um, the other thing we need to do is something that we can learn from some of the major corporations that have been uh, initiating autism hiring programs, which is to have different types of interview processes for different types of people um, so that you don't have a person come in to uh, an interview and you say, well, they were socially awkward and they only talked about themselves and they didn't make good eye contact and therefore I'm not even going to consider them. So, you know, neurodiversity is about expanding our appreciation of forms of difference. That's what we need to do in academia as well. So our next topic is uh, concerning asking for help. So what kind of steps can be taken to normalizing asking for help? And especially in academia, where we're very independent, we should be very independent. I think that um, we sometimes uh, assume that if somebody isn't asking for help uh, uh, or if somebody isn't getting help, it's because they didn't ask. But the reality is that it's hard to get help. Yeah. If I wanted to meet with a mental health care professional today, I would have to make call after call after call. And I probably just get messages saying we're not taking any new patients at this time. And I, and I, I might give up. And particularly if I was depressed, I might have not have the wherewithal mm -hmm. to keep at it. And so what we need to do is make sure that we continue to build our mental health infrastructure, because even if somebody desperately wants mental health care, I, you know, it's a struggle. And so when somebody gets into a doctor's office or a counselor's office, that counselor better realize how long and hard it took for that person to get there. Um, I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, but I, I, but I think that that's, that's something that we need to pay attention to. I think another important point, if I add to that, is that, you know, as academic, you know, we never receive any training at any points in our career about mental health in the sense of, you know, how to manage your own mental health or how to recognize when people around you are struggling with mental mm -hmm. health and what's the appropriate way of approaching somebody and offering them the right advice or path to take, you know, to, that could help them. And I think sort of their concepts like mental health literacy and first aid mental health and these things could, could go a long way in terms of uh, as a starter. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, I have found myself in the odd position of, um, uh, of being with a student who somehow sees me as a potential therapist, you know, that somehow I, and I, I'm an anthropologist and I'm not a clinician and I shouldn't be put in that position, but um, often a student will want to talk to the first person that they feel comfortable with. And they have a professor in me that talks about mental health and, and diminishing stigma. And so they're like, Oh, I'll talk to him. Well, <laughs> I need to then know how to somehow help that student navigate uh, a process where they can get care and I, and not for me to give it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I took I took recently a mental health uh, first aid course, and I was it was really an eye opener. Hmm. Particularly some of the role play exercises, where you have to face somebody who's experiencing a mental illness or a challenge, and you find yourself completely unprepared on 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 how to handle the situation and how to you know put them on the right direction. So. Uh, I think it's, I would strongly recommend it for, for everyone. Okay. Yelena? Okay, so if we're talking about individuals who have some of these disorders, can you uh, perhaps say something about the self-advocacy and uh, talking about the, their experiences? Do you have any advice on how to go around uh, to, doing, to do this? I end Nobody's Normal with um, the book, uh, just a brief discussion of the book, The Scarlet Letter, um, which most American high school students read at some point in time. It's the, it, written by Nathaniel Hawthorne in 1850 about a woman who is forced to wear the red letter A on her blouse as a punishment for adultery. And what most people forget about the book is that the main character, Hester, uh, comes back to the village after many, many, many years in exile, and she's still wearing this letter A, and all the judges say, and everybody in the community, you can take that off. It's been years and years and years. You don't have to wear that, that mark anymore of this A. And she says, oh, no, no, I'm going to continue to wear it because it ceased to be a stigma. Hawthorne in 1850 wrote the word stigma. This has ceased to be a stigma for me. It is a sign of my strength and endurance. And as a result of doing that, other people in the community begin to see her as somebody who's strong, strong and has endured. And when they have problems, they seek comfort and advice from her. So what a lot of, what, what I try to do by telling this story is that when somebody advocates for themselves, if they can do that, they are far less likely to be seen as weak mm -hmm. or sick and much more likely to be respected and admired for how strong they actually are. And so, I mean, this, is, this, is, this kind of advocacy is important, but there is an element of privilege to this advocacy. I could advocate for my daughter and I could teach my daughter to advocate because I had, you know, I've, I'm comfortable sitting in a room talking with the special educators at the school, or I feel comfortable threatening to sue the school if they don't give me the services that my daughter deserves. But what if I don't speak English well? What if it's my second or third language? What if I'm a recent immigrant? I am not going to have that ability to advocate in the same way. So on the one hand, yes, uh, the kind of advocacy that has been shown by the neurodiversity community is amazing. And we've seen it in academic areas too, where words that used to heart are being owned and refashioned like queer studies, crip studies, fat studies. But on the other hand, that kind of advocacy is a privilege and um, we need to appreciate the degree to which um, uh, other people may not have that ability. We should try to promote it. And how can we develop more tolerant and compassionate uh, culture with the relation to norm? Well, I'm not a huge fan of the word tolerance because it means that you, you know, endure something. I tolerate your difference. But, um, and, and most people who are sick don't want pity um, and they don't want toleration. Um, they just want to be treated, you know, in a way that's respectful. And... We find, you know, in this extreme case that somebody who is experiencing homelessness feels a kind of social death as people ignore them, look away, uh, move to another side of the street. Um, that kind of pain is, is really, really tough. It, that, that's serious suffering. And we can say, well, I'll tolerate the existence of people experiencing homelessness on the street. And maybe I'm even compassionate, but it doesn't mean I'll say hello 
or acknowledge them or look them in the eye because I might be afraid of them. I think that's, so, so tolerance and compassion only go so far. Um, what we really need to do is understand that they are people who are suffering are no different from us. Um, and that could be us in a few years, um, or it could be me now, but somewhere else on the spectrum. Okay, so then let's finish up uh, on this last uh, question. So going back to the beginning of your talk. So can you tell us, is there anyone that really wants to be normal? Yes, people do. <laughs> people do want to be normal. They want to be, many people actually do want to be average. Um, I, you know, I was, um, I think particularly in, um, communities that have long been discriminated against. Um, the idea of, you know, not being marked and identified as somebody to be um, associated with a particular kind of community or um, to um, be the, the victim of some act of prejudice might just want to be like, you know, an ordinary person. The comedian Chris Rock, uh, in one of his comedy dialogues talked about the street that he lives on. And he said, the street that he lives on is, is, is him and Mary J. Blige and Jay-Z and a white dentist. And he thought, you know, if you are African-American to get to this kind of place, you've got to be so special. And yet here's this sort of average guy who's not necessarily the greatest dentist in the world. And he's a dentist and he's living on that street. And so, yeah, I think the groups that have suffered from extraordinary discrimination may long for some sense of normalcy so that they are not marked out as, you know, either the, the, the rare few or the multitudes of people who remain the object of enduring stereotypes. Excellent. Okay, so I think we've reached the end of our session. So thanks again to both of you. And this is the first of the series of uh, seminars on mental health in society and academia. And hopefully you will register for the rest of them. And we will have uh, this talk shortly uploaded on the our YouTube uh, channel. Okay. Well, so if, thank you again. I just, if I may just say thank again, uh, Dr. Uh, Grenker, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us and for sharing your thought, wisdom, and personal feelings and experiences. It means a lot of it to us, and we look forward to hosting you here at the EPFL. Hopefully thanks. Here. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I'd love to visit in person sometime. Many thanks. I appreciate the invitation. We will make it happen. Have a great day. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye.